from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. So here we are, a week later. After last week hearing about the parable of the prodigal, and then remember how that parable ended, perhaps. The younger son who was irresponsible came home. His father welcomed him back into the household as if nothing had happened whatsoever. And throws a big party for him. The older son, who was very faithful and responsible, is out in the fields working, finds out that the younger son has come home, and rather being punished or chastised or corrected or making him, facing, making him face the consequences of his action, his father throws a party for him, so now the, young, the older son is bitter and angry, and the, and the parable ends. Jesus tells us that the father goes outside to talk to the older son and to encourage him to come back in, and, and there the parable ends. So here we are a week later, and nothing is resolved, right? As far as we know, the older son is still hanging out outside, bitter and angry, because the father's too irresponsible with everything that he has. The younger son's inside having a party, and we don't know, we don't know if either one of them will eventually understand, in even a small way, exactly how much the father loves them. It's like a cliffhanger. We don't know what's going to happen next. And I mentioned last week that that this isn't like the fairy tales that we grew up on where there was always a happily ever after at the end. No happily ever after in this parable. No resolution of the conflict within the family. No understanding on the part of, their, of the two sons how much their father really cares about them and gives himself to them. We don't see the older brother going into the party and forgiving his younger brother. We don't even know if the younger brother really comprehends the depth of his father's love. And there the parable ends, as I mentioned. That's a kind of a tough ending. Except, maybe, maybe the ending of the parable happens in you. Anybody remember what we said was the, was the major, what we understood to be the major point of the parable last week? Anybody remember what sort of the heart of the matter was? I know, I lost you at like the 25th minute last week or something like that. What we understood from the parable that Jesus was trying to communicate to us was that neither the younger son nor the older son trusted the love of the father. Neither the younger son nor the older son trusted the love of the father. Now after Jesus tells us parable, he continues his ministry, he continues his teaching, he continues to try and transform at least this small circle of 12 disciples so that they understand a little bit more about how much God the Father loves them. And if you follow the story through to the cross, you see what happens with all of that. You see that at the moment of his crucifixion, depending on the gospel story that you read, there are either a couple of God's disciples standing around, maybe just the one, or maybe none at all. Maybe after all these three years of teaching and giving of himself, of his spirit, of his teaching, of his wisdom, of his love, of his compassion, right. nobody gets it. Nobody gets it. In fact, that's what the gospel seems to tell us. What the women do on that first Easter Sunday morning is that they go to anoint the body at the tomb, expecting nothing but a dead Jesus, as we heard earlier today in the children's sermon. Nothing but a dead Jesus. Nobody at the critical moment of Jesus' ministry seems to get it. And so, like that older son and younger son, we don't know if anybody finally comprehends the love of the Father. And then Jesus is raised. And the question becomes one that's very, very serious for us as disciples on our journey of faith. Do we, in even a small way, begin to trust the love that the Father has for us? See, you and I are like those two sons who can either be living such a good life and feel that there are no consequences for our actions or be the older son who feels he has to earn everything that we don't really understand how deep the Father's love is for us. 
maybe the parable only finds its resolution in our grappling with the reality of that love. With what it means. Now this morning, in the reading from John's Gospel, we see one, one person who seems to get it. Who seems to begin to understand what Jesus is all about. And that person is Mary. The sister of Lazarus. Who has seen some wonderful things. Do you remember Mary? Do you remember her sister Martha? Earlier in John's Gospel, there are lots of people over at their house again, and, and Martha is running around trying to make sure everybody's happy and experiencing hospitality, well fed, well cared for. And she feels like all the burden is on her shoulders, right? Older sister, probably. And so she says to Jesus, Jesus, you see I'm working like crazy around here. Can't you tell my sister Mary to help me? What was Mary doing? Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus, hanging on his every word. She was trying to soak up everything that he had to offer. And Jesus says quite clearly to Martha, Mary has chosen the better part. A bit of a challenge to Martha's busyness. Mary has chosen the better part. She has chosen to try and absorb the teachings that I'm bringing to you. And it will not be taken away from her. It's the same Mary, then, we read about in this morning's read of John's Gospel, who anoints Jesus with this very expensive perfume and wipes his feet with her hair. A very intimate act, a very self-giving act, one of deep love. And Jesus says, when some of the disciples, notably Judas Iscariot, begin to argue and complain about this extravagant gift, that could have been given to the poor, Jesus says, leave her alone. She is preparing my body for burial. Mary somehow understands what's going to happen very soon. We know that from this place in Bethany, Jesus then goes on to Jerusalem and to his crucifixion. Somehow Mary gets it. I doubt that if you talk to her, she could have put it into words, but she understands the deep love that Jesus exemplifies from the Father in his life and death. And knows that when he goes to that cross, when he experiences the rejection, the suffering, the agony, it will not be for his own sake. But Mary understands that it will be for hers, as we are called to understand that it is also for our sakes. As we prepare to celebrate the drama of Holy Week just one week from today, we know that these events happen because God cares deeply about us. Younger son, older son, it doesn't matter. We are precious to God's heart. God loves us that deep. And so, the resolution of the parable, the fulfillment of Mary's act of self-giving, of sacrifice, takes place then in our lives. There's the miracle of these stories. That they come true here in the future. As we surrender ourselves more and more to that love and grace of God that is present in our lives. In our experience. As we gather together as the people of God to offer praise and thanksgiving. To pray to God about those deep needs that are within us. And to hopefully find our prayers answered. Not tomorrow. Perhaps. Little by little, as we continue to surrender ourselves and trust the love of the Father. Paul writes in Philippians, If anybody has reason to boast, I have more. I have every reason to be proud of the kind of person that I was, he says. But I have learned from my experience. That all those things that I consider precious and credentials for bragging about my worthiness before God were just garbage. They counted for nothing. They meant nothing. Because I could not comprehend, Paul tells us, the awesome love of God that came even to a sinner like me. Paul even calls himself in one place the chief of sinners chief of sinners. So any of you who want to lay claim to that title, you'll have to argue with Paul about it. 
He says, of all the people who have sinned and disappointed God and done things that they knew were wrong or didn't know that were wrong, he's worse than everyone. And yet, he says, because of that deep love that the father has, that extravagant father, that prodigal father who comes running down the road to welcome his children home, he is a new creation. And all that old stuff doesn't matter counts for nothing. It's in the past, he says. I wonder if that isn't enough for us this morning as we gather together to worship. As we continue to consider the, the tremendous depth and beauty of the parable of the prodigal and the deep, deep love of the Father that so often passes our ability to comprehend, to lay alongside it the reality that because of that, all those things that we carry around with us are in the past. The, mo the more we put them forward as, as signs of our unworthiness, the more we say to God, well, God can't work through me because I have these weaknesses, I have these failings, I have these things of which I'm ashamed. I cannot be forgiven. Believe me, sisters and brothers, I've heard those stories. I've heard people come and tell me about the depth of their sinfulness and how they felt that they were beyond the ability to be forgiven. And I want to suggest to you that if you feel that your sins are worse than anybody else's, there is really a very long line of people just like you who are trying to stand in line ahead of you on that. And what happens is when we feel that way, when we feel that we are of all people most unforgivable, we come right back into the position of those sons. Do you trust the love of God to be able to tell you that God will make all things new, as God promises in Isaiah, including you? Now, I would love more than anything else to be able to wake up tomorrow and be that new person. Don't sins get to be a drag after a while? I mean, literally a drag you're carrying around. It's like, oh my gosh, like I said on Ash Wednesday, really the same thing? Every time Ash Wednesday comes, I write the same stupid thing on the paper. I want God to change me, to fix me, to make me better, and do it tomorrow because you never know how long you're going to live. And yet God works slowly for real transformation within us. God always works to bring us along on that journey. Paul was very happy about his life until he saw the transformation that Jesus could bring. And then he looked back on all that stuff and he said, why did I hold on to that for so long? And so, not looking backwards, Paul says, he looks forward. He looks ahead to the opportunities that God has for him, for the wonderful things that God could do through him. Already here in Philippians, Paul has been an instrument of God's tremendous grace. He's imprisoned because of that. And yet he still says, I'd never trade it for anything because of the new me that God is creating every day. Here's the good news. God is creating a new you. And it has nothing to do with the old sinful stuff. Hopefully we learn from that stuff. But we also get forgiveness. That's why we're here, isn't it? <clears throat> because we know we need it. Maybe that's the only difference between people inside the church and people outside. Maybe the only difference is that we know we need forgiveness and they don't. Well, maybe they do and they can't admit it to themselves yet. And so we're here to receive exactly what we need. That forgiveness from God that says, okay, let's let the past be the past and move on to this new journey that I have set out for you as forgiven, grace-filled people. God says it right there in Isaiah. See, I am about to do a new thing. A new thing. Do you not perceive it? Honest to God, sometimes no. But sometimes yes. Sometimes we feel those stirrings deep within us. 
Sometimes when we approach this altar rail and kneel before our God with hands and hearts open, we receive exactly what we hoped and prayed for. A new start. New people. God doing new things through you. So perhaps you read the papers, you lament the state of the world, you look at your own life and wish that things were different. They are. They can be. They will be. As we surrender into God's loving care for the future. As you look at your life now, perhaps you think, this is not at all what I had in mind. And yet God has a future plan for you. Beyond our sense of unworthiness. Beyond our grief. Beyond our guilt. To get there, to get there, we're invited to trust the deep love of the Father. That same Father who comes running down the road to welcome us home, no questions asked. Sisters and brothers, in you and through you, God is doing a new thing, making a new you. Do you perceive it?